Hi there and welcome to this, the first in a series of tutorials showing how to install and configure the excellent PFSense. Now we're going to be doing this on both a physical machine and also as a KVM virtual machine on Unraid. So let's get to it. So welcome to the first part in my series of PFSense videos and in this first part I'm going to talk a little bit about PFSense and also what I intend to cover over this series of videos. So let's first talk about what actually PFSense is. Now I'm sure most of you already know but for those of you who have never heard of PFSense before let's quickly talk about that. PFSense is a custom open source distribution of FreeBSD, which functions as a fully featured firewall and router, and which is pretty much enterprise class. So it's extremely powerful and very flexible, but also it's really easily managed and configured through a web UI. And to bring extra functionality to PFSense, additional packages can be installed through its plugin system. And PFSense is a very mature piece of software starting its life way back in 2004 as a fork of Monowall. And more recently in 2014, PFSense was acquired by the company Electric Sheep Fencing and is now currently licensed under Apache License 2.0. So you may be wondering why you'd want to actually install PFSense and set up your own router when you already have one. Well, consumer routers really aren't very good. They're really quite bad. And this is even the case with the more expensive ones that you can buy. And the routers that our ISPs give us for free when we sign up for their broadband, well they're really the worst of the bunch. Let's face it, if an ISP is going to give you a free router, it's going to be the cheapest thing that they can source, so the quality is not going to be good. And most of them have very little functionality, because most people who have them, all they want to do is just plug it in get onto the internet and then be on Facebook or eBay or something. Most people will never log into their router's web UI. Anyway, the ISPs don't really want people doing that because they want their customers all using the same config. So when something goes wrong and the customer has to call technical support, they can just read off their script and ask you what color lights you can see on the front of the router and to tell you to turn it off and on. So as well as having very little functionality that's hard to access, the performance of consumer routers isn't great either. They normally have a low powered CPU and very little RAM, often only having about 64 megs of RAM, or if you're really lucky, maybe 128. So you may be thinking, well why does the CPU and RAM actually matter? So long as the router actually turns on and you get internet, it's doing its job, so that's fine. Well, that's actually not true, because it's probably not gonna be doing its job very well. Because if you think about it, the resources that the router has isn't just used up by its OS's footprint. Resources are used up by what's happening on the router as well. Think of how many devices are connected to your router. Nowadays we have a lot of devices, from computers to cell phones, tablets, games consoles, and even fridges sometimes connect. So a router in a modern household can have a lot of clients, and it has to keep track of and deal with all the connections from each of these devices. And each device isn't just making one connection to the internet at a time, it's probably making a whole load. Let's just think of a BitTorrent client for example. When downloading just one file, it will be making multiple connections to various peers and seeds on the network. And the chances are most BitTorrent clients will be either downloading or uploading a lot more than just one file. And it's the router's job to keep track of all of these connections from all of the clients which it keeps in something called a states table, which is held in RAM. And routers often do more duties than this. Some allow you to plug a hard drive in and use it as a file server, while some of the more expensive ones allow you to run an open VPN server. And all of this uses up resources. And what happens when it's all used? Well, something has to give. So you can see that the cheap hardware that these routers use may not be good enough for what we power users want from our network we'll get much better results building our own router with PFSense. And don't forget about security. Do you really trust your ISP router's firewall? 
when was the last time your router had a security update? Um, maybe never? Well, wouldn't you rather have a firewall using open source software used by millions that's updated regularly? Of course you would. And that's why I'm making this series of videos. So you can build yourself a really secure, functional router. And over the course of these videos, I'll be showing you how to set up various different things on PFSense. But to give you an idea of the kind of things you can do, let me show you what I do with my PFSense. I'm using two PFSense routers on my network, although they're not both turned on at the same time. And there's a really good reason for that. And that's because my main PFSense machine is running as a VM on my Unraid server. And this works really well. But what happens if I turn off my server? Well, obviously the internet's gonna go down and then I'm gonna get in trouble with my family. So what I've done to get around that is I have an old small form factor PC also running PFSense. This is off most of the time, but if my server shuts down, a script runs which sends a wake on LAN packet, switching this on so it can take over the network duties. So that way, I feel I'm getting the best of both worlds. Now I could easily just have the physical box switched on all the time and have done with that, but for my use case it really makes sense to use a VM. There can be a lot of advantages to running PFSense inside a VM. Now the most obvious one is my server's on 24 hours a day, so by running PFSense inside the VM, then I'm not using any extra energy running a second box. But another reason is because I have a 10 gigabit ethernet card in my server, which directly connects to my workstation. So I can transfer files between the server and my workstation really fast. And by throwing a PFSense VM into the mix, I can have my 10 GB network adapter on my Unraid server bridged to a virtual adapter inside the PFSense VM. So now what this will let me do is to be able to give out DHCP, DNS and internet through the 10 GBE cable to the workstation. So this avoids me having to have a separate normal gigabit ethernet cable plugged into the workstation in order to get internet. So I find that really useful. And another advantage I have running PFSense in a VM is that my server CPU is much newer than the old Celeron that I'm rocking in my backup PFSense box, which doesn't support AESNI. Now, that isn't a problem right now, but when the next PFSense comes out, version 2.5, that's gonna be a requirement. So that means it's only gonna be my PFSense VM that's gonna be able to run the new system. So what else does PFSense do for me? Well, it runs my OpenVPN server, so I can access my network when I'm away from home. But as well as an OpenVPN server, I also run multiple OpenVPN clients, going to various private internet access endpoints, one to the USA, one to here in the UK, and one to Germany. So with this setup, I can choose which devices on my network connect to which endpoint, and I find this really useful. For instance, all of my Internet of Things devices, such as my Amazon Alexa, they all connect through the USA endpoint, and also they're also in their own VLAN, so they can't see anything else on my network. For any torrents, I've got my Deluge Docker container connected going through Germany, and all of my PCs on the network, they connect through the London VPN. However, any games consoles in the house, they all just connect through the regular internet, bypassing the VPN altogether. I find this really useful because I can fully use my private internet access account and have full privacy on different devices on my network. So that's some of the things I do with my PFSense on my network. We'll be looking at how to set up all of this which I've discussed, but we'll also be looking at other things such as how to block ads with PFSense at the router level, bandwidth management, and we'll be looking at setting up things like Squid Proxy and Squid Guard. If there is anything in particular people would like covered, then please put it in the comments of this video, and I'll see if I can include it in the later videos. The nice thing about PFSense is it's really powerful enough to do pretty much anything you're going to need on your network. And if you don't need much, well, it's also pretty much as simple as plug and play. Well, almost. Anyway, this intro is getting too long, and the next part of this video, we're going to be looking at what hardware to use for PFSense. And yes, this applies both for a physical PFSense box and a VM PFSense. Then after looking at the hardware, we're going to install PFSense ready to configure. That's all in the next part. So for now, have a think if PFSense is for you 
and if so, then I'll catch you in the next part in a couple of days. Either way, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, then please help me by hitting the like button, and hey, subscribe if you're not already. And I'd just like to thank all of my Patreons and all of the people that have supported my channel. I really appreciate it. It's you guys that make all of this possible. Anyway guys, it's time for me to go. So whatever you're up to for the rest of the day, I hope it's good, and I'll catch you all next time.